Welcome into the KSO Show. I am Mason Voth, joined by Drew Galloway. And with the holiday weekend that uh, just took place, it's been a couple of days since we talked to everybody. There was also an additional day in there because both D.Y. and Drew were busy elsewhere around. The, well, for Drew, it was the state. For D.Y., it was the country. D.Y. was down in Nashville checking out the On3 Elite Series, which basically everybody from On3 was down there. Some of the top recruits in the country were there. Uh, and just a lot of different things going on that's a, a pretty cool initiative that On3 has going. So uh, you can go to the main national page to check out more on that. And I'm sure uh, DY will have some stories for us about that at some point. But Drew uh, is kind of going all throughout the state this week. He was in Salina yesterday. He'll be in Manhattan tomorrow. And uh, both have to do with recruiting and kind of I guess this is, you know, yesterday was more about kind of evaluation for Drew and getting to see guys. Uh, tomorrow, Drew will certainly get to, to craft his own opinion with what he sees, but it's a really significant time for the K-State coaching staff. So before we discuss what's going on tomorrow, uh, what was yesterday like for you? Because you were at the uh, at the Sharp stuff in Salina. Yeah, so uh, Jake Sharp, former KU football player. So, you know, you, you do lose a little bit there. But Jake, super nice guy, always puts on a top prospect combine for every single player in the state it's invite only for this one so it's a pretty exclusive club of like who gets to come you get to kind of see what the camps are like and what the players are like because it's not always people that you really like know about right away like uh last year was the that the sharp combine was the first time that i got to see lincoln cure for example and he was a guy that i was like huh i don't really know anything about him like i'll just keep it keep in my notes like there's a kid from goodland don't really know anything about him like looks like he could be a power four guy and now he's a top 30 player in the country so it, it's a fun like exposure thing uh, because like I, I use the cure example but another one that we kind of talked about and reminisced on uh yesterday with some of the people that were there was that this was also the first introduction uh, to the world of Dylan Edwards and Jaron Canick, where they would come and Dylan Edwards lit it up as a sophomore. And everybody was like, who is that? Like, who is this kid from Derby? That's like five, seven, five, eight running back that ran like a four, four as a, and Jaron Canick was the same way. Like, who is this huge kid that could play probably linebacker from Hayes that ran a four, four. So it's been fun. Like, over the years seeing who kind of comes in and as a guy is like huh i need to really like think about this guy and like what he could do and then they end up really blowing up so in terms of those guys because obviously you got to talk to lincoln cure yesterday a little bit uh you have a good update on his recruiting situation up on kso right now so head over there and uh, he kind of gives thoughts on k-state and then also a little bit on each of the spots he's going to visit now, in terms of uh, other players that were there, though, and you talk about guys standing out in recent years and kind of being the introduction, uh, probably not necessarily in the 2025 class because, you know, that's starting to wind down. But is there anybody beyond uh, that you saw there yesterday that you just kind of marked down that is the time being, oh, I should probably keep tabs on them or, you know, kind of keep myself up to speed on what they're doing in case the K-State offer comes their way? The guy that I think I would really uh, keep in mind for the 2026 class is actually a Manhattan high prospect. Uh, JJ Dunnigan, his dad played at K-State. Uh, right now, he just has one offer and it's from Colorado State, but I could see that easily uh, changing over the summer because I believe he's going to a handful of camps and I would imagine that K-State will be one of them. He's 6'2", 6 6'3". Could play corner or safety probably at the next level. Has a lot of length, good speed. And he was one of the top prospects of the entire day, regardless of class, because yesterday was a day where 2025, 26, 27, and I believe there was a 2028 prospect there as well. So you kind of got to see a little bit of everybody and where everybody was. And JJ Dunnigan was somebody that really stood out to me. So you mentioned probably going to start taking some of these camps, and that's what Thursday is about. It's the start of kind of K-State's camp schedule, uh, which you know is, is something that they've done for a long time. I mean, I remember going and sitting in the stands uh, with 
with Matt, D.Y., and John uh, when, you know, Bill Snyder was still the coach and, and watching uh, things unfold. Uh, so what what is tomorrow going to look like for those that aren't aware, and, and how impactful is it not just to what you do in keeping up with recruiting, but even more specifically the K-State coaching staff because uh, they seem to, to find a lot of the guys that they end up getting on the roster at these camps. Yeah, so camps are extremely important for K-State because this is where you get – it's kind of like yesterday, but more narrowed down. Like you'll get 2025s, 2026s, 2027s. And I imagine you'll you'll probably see a, a, an occasional 2028 uh, prospect roll through Manhattan as well. And it's important because the K-State coaches love to see kids compete and evaluate them and see them against competition because you don't always know what your competition is like uh, when you see somebody on and like their highlight film but once you get them in manhattan and you get to see them around uh other guys that this is probably uh a guy that we would like to offer and then you really get to see this in the 2025 class because they they always find a few guys that they have brought to camps that they offer and close on very very quickly or like last year uh if you remember like Callan barda came to a camp case it didn't offer but kind of put him on the back burner offered eventually and then ended up uh landing him and then Zashawn rich was the same way where he went to a camp didn't get offered at the camp but case it kind of kept on it kept on it kept on it and eventually offered it and he committed and signed as well so the camps are extremely important because you see how much the case it really likes to to see kids compete and especially on the offensive line. I mean, I talked about, I think it was last week or two weeks ago when we talked about uh, offensive linemen, that K-State's entire offensive line on the roster, I think 50, 60% of them have camped at K-State at least once. And I would imagine that that trend continues because I, I believe that you'll see uh, some of the major offensive linemen that K-State are going after now camp or it, even like they could have camped the previous year and then end up committing because last year, I believe everybody, but Kyle rockers, including uh, Navarro Shunky had camped at K state at least once. So in terms of what you'll see tomorrow and then through the rest of uh, camp season, what's, what will that schedule kind of look like and what do you anticipate uh, getting out of that? Uh, so I, I'm anticipating I believe it's June. Let me pull up the the official dates here, because the the camp cycle and how the recruiting calendar works now is a little bit different this year with how quickly like fall camp and the games will start because of how everything lines up on the calendar calendar wise. So tomorrow is the first camp, and then there's the one June second. Then uh, the big skill camp is June 7th, which is where you'll probably see a lot of guys, even in the younger classes that are at the skill positions, really kind of be where they get noticed and take off. I know that uh, Emporia tight end from the 2026 class, Ian Primer, will be at that camp. Uh, the offensive line, defensive line camp is June 9th, which is one of the best camps that K-State puts on every year. And it's... Connor Riley just puts together a good list of offensive linemen that come. And then the defensive line has really kind of taken off in the last few years as well. And then the last camp is June 23rd. So this is a big time for evaluation and kind of getting to know prospects and seeing them in person. Because a lot of guys like the, the out of state guys, obviously, like I'd, I haven't really seen in person yet. So it's fun to kind of see them. And then it's not just at K-State. But there will be camps in like Lindenwood and St. Louis and Georgia and Florida and Texas that all of the other K-State coaches will go to periodically throughout the month of June. So it's a busy time for them and kind of juggling everything around and seeing a bunch of prospects and offering kids and you'll see a bunch of offers go out. And then and then don't forget, because, you know, June can't be more chaotic. Uh, official visits also kick off this weekend as well and throughout the month of June. Yeah, this, uh, it's it's going to be a hectic time for K-State uh, and, and the way football is you know kind of going for them now and, and what the future of that starts to bring. So that's, uh, that's what you've been doing yesterday and then we'll be also doing tomorrow. So 
with all that going on uh, and, and trying to keep things kind of in check, uh, I guess real quick, give people as much as you want on uh, what you took away from Lincoln Cure yesterday, because I'm sure everybody will be interested in that. Uh, I think that kind of the main takeaway is that I still think that K-State is in the driver's seat. And I, I think that it's becoming closer and closer to not really being a contest at the, at the moment. Like, I, I just think that Casey has really done a good job with everything they've done with him. And the, the thing that he kept bringing up and joking about with me is, well, I've been to Manhattan like probably nine, ten times now. I'm excited to see what they have that's new for him. So that, that's something that I'm really looking forward to learning and hearing about as his official visit gets closer of what k State is planning on doing. But I, like I said, like with Lincoln Cure, the longer that this plays out, no news is good news because it means that k State's still on the lead. Yeah, I think, uh, and I, I think your your story yesterday did a good job of kind of illustrating that. I think if people go and read it, they'd go through, and there would be like at one point where they'd kind of go, "Oh, I don't know, that doesn't sound too promising." And then you you read what he had to say about K State, and you go, "Oh, okay, never mind. Uh, I'm I'm all in again." And then I did laugh uh, at uh, it was I. Sports in Kansas posted the the video of their interview with with Lincoln, yes. and he was talking about uh, his brother and uh, who's now a walk on at, at KU. And I, I think that that would be a, an interesting one for K State fans to go and listen to and find because you'd probably have a good laugh. Because uh, the way I took it, it, he basically admits that like, yeah, I'm not going to KU is the way that it comes across. It's just like, yeah, I kind of told him I didn't want to play with him. I, you know, I thought it might be more fun to, to play against him or something and mentions the Sunflower Showdown. So uh, that that's worth your time to, to go and check out because uh, I know that as K-State people, you're you're interested in the hunt for a five-star that seems to have K-State in a very high regard. So that is everything other, going on with – oh, go ahead. I was going to say the other thing that I, I would kind of make sure that you see – is uh what he had to say about uh, Avery Johnson and Dylan Edwards to me because the, the, yes. the Dylan Edwards comment was pretty funny. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I was getting a little worried. Uh, maybe maybe that's a hang up in all of this, and uh, maybe there's going to have to be some kind of competition or something to get that 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 problem sorted out. And uh, if you want to know what that is, go to KSO. Read Drew's update on problem. Lincoln Cure. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Problem. All right, uh, let's shift gears now because we are two days away from K-State baseball being back in the NCAA tournament for the first time since 2013. I mean, can you believe it? They uh, they somehow found a, a way to to scratch their way into this thing after the last couple of years, fighting hard at, to the end of the Big 12 tournament and making it seem like, oh, maybe they're on the cusp of it, uh, last year being one of the last four teams out. They made some adjustments to their schedule, so they shot up higher in the RPI. That seemed to be the the kicker that got them in this season. And now they get to go to Fayetteville, a place where they've played a regional before. And I, I noted on uh, Monday when uh, the, it was announced that K-State has now played three of the regionals in school history. Arkansas has been there with them, once in Manhattan, once in Fayetteville. Uh, what was your initial reaction to K-State getting into the NCAA tournament? And for the most part, it seemed like a foregone conclusion to most people in the know here that like, they're going to get in, uh, despite the fact that the last month and a half, and really at different points throughout the season, you scratch your head and go, "This team's an NCAA tournament team," but uh, they they are in, and they're going to get their chance to prove themselves. I think that even with kind of the we we kind of expected them to make it, despite the end of the season, it was still kind of just the the sigh of relief. Like th this team has been on a cusp the last three seasons and hadn't made it in any of them. And I, I think that because of that, I, I was kind of going into the selection show, like kind of expecting the worst. Of maybe they, maybe for some reason, case they doesn't make it. They're like team 69 or 70 again. And then we all kind of, I, I don't know what would kind of be everybody's reaction because for me, it'd be like, you you tell K State last year that you need a better RPI. They do that now, and then they wouldn't have made it. I feel like everybody would have kind of had a meltdown in that standpoint. 
but it, it's fun to be in the college baseball tournament. The college baseball tournament is one of my favorite times of the year because it's just a very underrated, like nobody really thinks about it when they think of like big events on the sports calendar. But having baseball on all day, especially for us, like working from home, kind of getting to do what we do. It's so fun to have something on in the middle of the day that we can turn on and watch. And, and I, I think that it, it's not a great draw because Arkansas's pitching is amazing, but it's also just kind of funny to me because like you said, like it feels like K-State and Arkansas line up with this a lot, even though K-State's only played the NCAA tournament for baseball five times. Yeah. Yeah, they find their their ways to uh, meet up a couple times. It is it is an interesting thing the way K State was able to get in, and and as you saw on Selection Sunday, like not even considering the fact that there were teams in the Big Twelve, o- Oklahoma and Oklahoma State both get to host. So uh, two of the top sixteen national seeds are inside the Big Twelve, but also they played on the road at Tennessee this year. They played on the road at Clemson this year. Also, schools that get to host. So they no doubt did what they needed to do in terms of bolstering the you know, the, the schedule resume to go up in the RPI. Cause they also played that road game early at, at Arizona state. Uh, and then they had the, the Northeast trip to go see Connecticut Northeastern that, you know, historically have been two of the better programs up in that part of the country. I know UConn was a little, uh, both UConn and Northeastern were down this year compared to others, but RPI wise, they still, uh, get a bump from that. So they were, they were conscious of it. They did what they needed to do. Uh, but it was by the skin of their teeth. I mean, there are three seed, and I think a lot would would kind of point and say the talent that was on this team and the way things had been building, you would have thought that this season would have trended more towards being a two when they started Big 12 play six and one, and they found just a lot of frustrating ways to uh, kind of fall behind and, and be in this spot where – not necessarily sweating it out, but you were a little bit nervous about what was coming what was coming up. So because of the way that the season went, what what are expectations for K-State in Fayetteville? What what do you need to see to be satisfied with how they handle this opportunity to be in the NCAA tournament? Ooh, that's tough because even like you see Louisiana Tech as uh, the the first team, and I, I know that people will probably kind of point to that and be like, well, what's competition like there? Which, I mean, 18 and 6 in conference, but that's a pretty dang good baseball team, 45 and 17. So it, it's not like a super winnable, like you can write it off and put, kind of put case date in the driver's seat to win that. So I, I think that my expectation and goal and hope is to at least just win one game and it doesn't matter what game it is or which one it is. Just you don't want to go zero and two in this scenario when you hadn't made the tournament since 2013. I feel like you kind of lose a little bit of the hype if you go into Fayetteville and you lose both games, especially with. I mean, Owen Borama has really kind of turned his season around pitching the last few weeks, the last few games, and then uh, Jackson Wentworth has been nails all season outside of the Big Twelve tournament. So you hope that because of the two guys that you're starting in these two, first two games that you can at least win one game. Yeah, that's uh, it, yeah. I think I think you don't want to go down there and be you know two and done. Basically, that would leave a pretty bad taste in your mouth. I would I would say, uh, and like you talked about, K State the you know the bats have been a question this year. They were they were bottom third in the Big Twelve uh, in terms of of batting average. They're on base percentage are lower. So offense has been a struggle at times for them. And you rely pretty heavily on some of those guys to come through in the right moment. And they had enough games this year where they did, but they also had a handful of games where they couldn't. And there is an element to it where some of it is very unforced with how K-State has played things this year. They were uh, one, they were top four in terms of most errors in the Big 12 this year. So fielding has been a question at times for them. Uh, they were also in the top half of the league in terms of hit batters. So they're like giving the most maddening of free passes at times. So I think it'll be interesting to see what they do down there. But the other thing that I would remind people, like K-State has this has the talent. We know that they have the arms in the bullpen, uh, which can be valuable. Like you said, Owen Borma's kind of started to turn things around. Like, I I wouldn't be shocked one way or the other if K-State went down and lost their first two games and they were done. Or, you know, if we're sitting here on Monday next week, 
getting ready for K-State to play a winner-take-all game to advance to a Super Regional. Like, this team really has that wide of a margin of what they can do. Um, now, if you want to talk about what's more likely to happen than the other, I think we all know what that is, but it is just one of those things to, to kind of take note of. And this is, this is a big deal for K-State because these Midwest schools do not make it to the NCAA tournament uh, all that often, as has been showcased by K-State. They haven't been back since that 2013 team. And so you, you got to embrace the moment and celebrate it. And like, this is, this is a credit to Pete Hughes for being able to come in in the last couple of years, make K-State baseball more consistent, show that you can get talent to, to, camp, to Manhattan. And now you have a chance to play in the NCAA tournament. You got to go do something with it. There's also the element of it too, that like this was, this was much needed for Pete Hughes in terms of how things are trending. And now, even though you want to focus on what's ahead, you kind of think about moving forward. How can you capitalize on this and ensure that this happens more frequently and that your own mistakes, because as I talked about, K-State does not feel the ball very well relative to the rest of their competition. They struggled at the plate this year. They make some really dumb outs on the base paths. Like they do a lot of mind numbing things, both as players and coaches that make you go, they very easily could have been on the wrong side of this bubble again this year. And it would have been, all on themselves. So like, this is a big deal moving forward. Uh, so in, in terms of that, wh- how do you view the Pete Hughes situation with K-State baseball and uh, kind of the big picture of them making this tournament and what comes next? I think big picture, this is something that you can really build on because like you said, like Midwest teams don't make it super often when they do make it, it's hard for them to find some success. So just making it in, probably not going 0-2 is probably what you would like to see from this weekend kind of going forward. Uh, But big picture wise, I think that K-State baseball is turning in the right direction because even though uh, they hadn't made the tournament in the last two years, it just feels like they're more competitive and they're more in some of these bigger games and bigger series and even in more consideration to make the NCAA tournament now than they were near the end of Brad Hill's tenure. So I think that you're seeing them trend in the right direction, bringing in a lot of talent. Now it's okay. We have all this talent. Can we execute with it? So I I think that you're kind of trying to build on this year and probably be able to make the tournament at least half of the times because in a non-revenue sport at K-State, it it can be tough. And especially in baseball where I think Mm -hmm. since like, the last like 20 years, no team that isn't from the South or the West has won. So I think that if you can make the tournament at, at least half of the time, you're probably turning in the right direction of, okay, we're at least consistently making the tournament. Now, how do we build on that? So it, it's all about building towards the next steps. And I think that with the baseball facility and the stadium kind of getting an upgrade, you're going to see more talent come in. And Pete Hughes is one of the best recruiters in uh, all of K-State sports. So if he can kind of build on the talent, I think that you'll see more success. And the one thing that I think that they really need to address, not just for next season, but kind of just going forward based on the entire Pete Hughes tenure, is that they need to just keep acquiring more and more pitching because I, I feel like that's kind of been kind of the hang up is that they have some one or two really good starters and a couple good bullpen pieces, but it's the depth that they really need to build up. It's, it's such a tough thing to do in in baseball. Like there's, you know, pitching is the currency in the sport and college baseball, college baseball is closer to being nine and 10 year old kid pitch than it is triple a baseball from the product that you see. And it's no matter where you go, typically the most, the more pitching you have, the better off you're going to be. And I think it's going to be kind of fascinating moving forward to see how they can, you know, try and find things to do and, and make things work out. And I, the, the biggest thing that Pete Hughes has done for K-State baseball is, like I said earlier, is proving that you can get the talent to Manhattan uh, because he's certainly done that ever since he got here, whether it's through high school recruiting or the transfer portal. He's gotten guys here that they're here and they're immediately talked about like, oh, yeah, they're going to go in the top five rounds of, of the MLB draft and getting other guys put into Major League Baseball. Yeah, and it, yeah go ahead. They'll probably have a, a second first round MLB draft pick after yeah. 
after this year with Kalen Culpepper. So, I mean, they're bringing in a lot of talent. Yeah, they're they're doing it. And that's the thing we're setting up moving forward. It's now on Pete Hughes to find the ways that he can improve himself as an in-game coach. Because like you said, the recruiting is a big deal. And we, we hear about a lot, especially in college basketball, that like being a head coach, it it's more recruiting than it is actually coaching. Uh, there are elements to, to Pete Hughes's game where you still see you got to know how to actually manage this thing. And so I think he set this up for himself moving forward that it'll be a real make or break type of thing for him where um, you got to kind of keep showing that this isn't just going to be, OK, we're satisfied being a bubble team. How can you better yourself moving forward? Because people will understand that making the NCAA tournament, that's it may not be a realistic thing to say that happens every year and that you're a you know, a top team or whatever, because you're in the Midwest. Like this is not the eighties and nineties when Wichita state was able to do that. Nobody in the the heart of the Midwest is doing that right now. There's a reason why a ton of big 10 teams don't play baseball very well. There's a reason why schools like Iowa state and Colorado don't even have baseball. Like it's a tough thing to do in this area, but you've proven that you can get the talent here and you got to find a way to keep bettering things and, kind of raising up because you may have set the expectations a little too high for yourself. And I do feel like at times, myself included, think that I maybe I am too hard on Pete Hughes because of that. Because like what you were saying, you know, the end of the Brad Hill stuff, it was ugly. They were not very good. They were doormats for the rest of the Big 12. And Pete Hughes shows up his first year in the league. He wins eight games, which was three wins better than the season before. And then they won 10 games in 2021 and they struggled – uh, in 2022, but the last two years, they've won 13 and 15 games in league play. So they've improved their standings. They finished in the top half the last two years, and now they're in the NCAA tournament. We'll see what ends up coming out of that. So this is a look at the Fayetteville Regional and what the schedule kind of looks like there. Arkansas will get SEMO in the first game. They're going to play at 2 o'clock on Friday. All these games will be on ESPN+. And then K-State in the evening, they face Louisiana Tech. Uh, and then the winners will play on Saturday at 8 o'clock. But before that, there will be the losers that play at 2. And so if you lose your first game, you basically, you're going to have to win four straight games, and there's a chance that a handful of them come against the same opponent that you've already faced. So if you win three with no losses, you're off to the Super Regionals. You win four with one loss, you're off there, and you can kind of see how things end up working out. And like you said, Drew, like Arkansas – the, a very strong pitching staff and Louisiana Tech, uh, not a sleeper by any means. You might see a, a Conference USA team there and think, uh, oh, well, that's that's not too bad. But no, Louisiana Tech has a pretty strong program. So uh, we'll see what it brings for K-State, but no doubt a good deal and an exciting time for uh, Kansas State to have postseason baseball again. Because like you were saying earlier, the men's and women's College World Series, like, doesn't always get the most love during the regular season. The regular season is a really, really bad product. But when you add the drama that comes with the postseason and the way that it's just kind of formulated where you're playing the same teams, you have to win so many games, it's a really exciting thing to watch. It has that extra layer to it. So uh, for K-State to be involved in it, it's an exciting time and, and really fun to see. Yeah, it's super fun to see. And like uh, looking just at the regional, like, SEMO also a pretty solid program so I mean it, it's a tough regional just overall the the thing that I keep just thinking about is like with how this case 18 has played all year going 0 and 2 wouldn't surprise me in the regional but also going 2 and 0 to start the regional wouldn't surprise me it's so like I I'm really excited to see kind of how it goes in just for like to give context to everybody, because I know I don't know if everybody kind of watches college baseball tournaments or whatever. It, it even though you see like SEMO as the four, it's pretty common that the four seed will beat the one seed as the host in the first game and just kind of cause chaos for the rest of the regional. And I think that that kind of adds a really fun element too, because with double elimination, like even if Arkansas loses round or their first game, like they still get to host and still get to kind of crawl their way back in. So it's fun in that perspective too, but you, you know that I'll be uh, rooting for SEMO and K-State in the first two games. Yeah, that's uh that's, that's good, good spot to be. You'd like to see K-State and SEMO matching up uh, in the, the Brad corn bowl. 
uh, there Ooh. for uh, the second Great game. Foul on Saturday. So we'll see how it goes for K-State baseball, but you can catch it all on ESPN plus, or uh, if you want the hometown broadcast, uh, I know that uh, K-Man will have that for you as well. So that's what it is looking like for K-State sports that week. Drew will be busy tomorrow with camp in Manhattan, and we'll have a, a full update for that on Friday because we owe you a recruiting show this week. So that's what we'll do. And uh, then we'll be ready for the Batcats on Friday night and the rest of the weekend. So, for Drew Galloway, I'm Mason Voth. Head over to kstateonline.com to check out all of your needs on K-State football and basketball recruiting and everything else going on with both teams. And uh, you can find us over there at On3 and stay right here and subscribe to the KSO YouTube page. So we're out of here. We'll talk to you again tomorrow.